Welcome back to another video and in this video we're going to be looking at part five and the final part on the duties of trustees. So the next duty is to act impartially as between beneficiaries. So trustees must act impartially between the beneficiaries. So you cannot exercise your discretion in favour of your favourite member of the family and leave the rest with nothing, for example. Although courts tend not to interfere because trustees have a wide discretion, which is what we'll see in just a second in the Nestle case. So in general terms, a trustee is obliged to act impartially as between all of the beneficiaries. And that's really made clear in the Cohen and Scargill case from 1985. Now, at one level, this requires that the trustees to exercise fairness as between each beneficiary, showing no favour to any one. And at another level, this requires the beneficiaries to act even handedly between different classes of beneficiaries. It is suggested that the duty of impartiality is akin to the duty not to permit a conflict of interests in that the trustee is expected to stand apart from partisan considerations. As a fiduciary, the trustee is required to act in relation to each of the beneficiaries without any grace or favour, in the same way that the trustee must not take any personal advantage from the trust. So, a trustee is expected to act impartially between beneficiaries and between life tenants and the remaindermen. At its simplest level, then, the trustee is to treat each member of the same class of objects in the same way on the basis that each object has identical rights to all other members of the same class. The trustees are also required to act impartially between different classes of beneficiary and not simply between beneficiaries of the same class. Now, the clearest example of the situation in which trustees have difficulty in acting impartially between different classes of beneficiary arise in relation to trusts in which there is a life tenant entitled to the income of the trust and beneficiaries in remainder whose interest is the capital of the fund. In such a situation, the trustee is obliged not to focus the investment and distribution of the trust fund on the generation of short-term income for the life tenant when that would be to the detriment of the remainder beneficiaries who would depend on there being capital left in the trust fund. And we can see that from Reed Barton's trust, that particular situation. However, even treatment need not mean that each object of a trust receives the same property under a discretionary trust. Rather, each of them is entitled to equally impartial consideration. It says here, however, the trustees have a wide discretion. They are, for example, entitled to take into account the income needs of the tenant for life or the fact that the tenant for life was a person known to the settler and a primary object of the trust, whereas the remainderman is a remoter relative or stranger. So if you leave property in trust for your children, then a remainder to your grandchildren, you can, within limits, favour the life tenant at the expense of the grandchildren, in other words, the remaindermen. So Hoffman here was rejecting a mechanistic approach to discharging investment duties, holding in re um, reality trustees have a wide discretion in making their investment decisions. Another trustee duty is to consider relevant matters and disregard irrelevant matters when making decisions. So imagine for a moment how wonderful your life would be if you had a magic eraser with which you could wipe out all of your poor choices in life before going back and making those choices again. Now, in the law of trust, the principle of Hastings Bass seems to offer trustees and their advisors just such a magic eraser if that they could ask the court to set aside any inappropriate exercise of their powers or discretions so that they could make their choices again. Um, now, this was particularly useful where the trustees and their advisees had, advisors had inadvertently made a decision which had an unfortunate tax or other consequence for the trust. So we're now going to consider this row but from Hastings Bass to Pitt and Holt. 
So in the case of Hastings Bass, um, you should owe a small thanks to the case and thanks to that it has been overruled relatively recently. Okay, The reasoning in the case is that if a trustee took a decision which later turned out to have an adverse tax consequence, then the trustee in question had disregarded relevant matters when making that decision. In other words, by failing to consider the tax consequences of a particular transaction, they had failed to consider a relevant matter. So that was a breach of trust. And since it was a breach of trust, the transaction in question was void. So it was regarded as never happened and all the consequences also never happened. So this meant that if a trustee made a mistake in investing income in a tax efficient way and later realised that, they could just go to the court and say they are in breach of trust for failing to consider a relevant matter to get the transaction void. For 35 plus years, they've got away with this. So trustees for all this time really had a get out of jail free card, whereby if they made a mistake and ran up a tax bill they didn't need to, they could apply for a ruling under this case to make the transaction void, meaning they didn't have to pay the tax. And this situation went on until 2011, where the case of Pitt and Holt um, came in and the Court of Appeal overruled this rule. So the rule in Hastings Bass has really been described by one academic, Gordon, as a magical morning after pill for trustees suffering post-transaction remorse. For trust law and tax professionals, the doctrine in Hastings Bass appeared to make it possible to undo any exercise of a trustee's power or discretion which had unforeseen circumstances. So the case meant that a trustee's discretion and power may be declared void and set aside on the basis that the trustees failed to take into account relevant matters when exercising the power. The Supreme Court has subsequently reviewed and restricted the use of this rule, narrowing the scope of the Hastings Bass Rule to that which was originally intended. As a result, trustees may no longer rely on the Hastings Bass Rule where they have acted within their powers and in accordance with professional advice, even if that advice proves to have been an error. So in Pitt and Holt, and we've got Futter and Futter, this is a joint appeal. The Court of Appeal in this case, so that was in 2011 was the Court of Appeal case, overturned the rule in Hastings Bass. Strictly speaking, actually, they didn't overturn it. They severely limited the rule and the way it had been applied for two reasons. Firstly, a trustee who takes proper advice and acts on that advice is not in breach of trust for failing to consider the consequences. And secondly, if a trustee takes a decision in breach of this duty, the transaction is voidable and not void. So this means that the transaction will remain valid until it is voided and any tax liability before it, um, before it is voided will remain. Now, in this case, a man had a rather large settlement for an injury he suffered on a job. And for reasons which are not really entirely clear, having taken advice, they decided not to put the money in a trust for a person suffering a disability, which would have been exempt from tax, but just in an ordinary trust. So therefore it incurred a tax bill. When they realized that they didn't need to pay the tax due to the existence of the disability trust, they applied to the court under the ruling of Hastings Bass, hoping to get out of paying the tax. Unfortunately for Mrs Pitt, the Inland Revenue appealed. Now previously the HMRC had not appealed any of the cases, but in this case they took a stand and took the case to the Court of Appeal. And the HMRC won the case. Okay? Mrs Pitt wasn't in breach of trust, and even if she was, it was not a void transaction, it was merely voidable. So she had to pay the tax bill. Now the case then went to the Supreme Court in 2013, and they allowed an appeal, but they confirmed the reasoning on Hastings Bass. So Mrs Pitt did actually get the money back. They allowed the transaction to be rescinded on the ground of mistake. But as far as the ruling in Hastings Bass is concerned, if you take advice, you're not 
in breach of trust and in any case the transaction is good and to avoid it. So any tax liability remains until that point. So it was held that it, um, that it required that the trustees have committed a breach of trust before the principle can be invoked. Therefore, there must be some breach of the trust instrument or some breach of the general law of trusts before the principle can be invoked. Furthermore, the trustees must be demonstrated to have taken into account an irrelevant consideration or to have failed to take into account a relevant consideration, provided that in either case the consideration was of an appropriate sort. Thus, for example, the colour of the trustees' socks would not have been appropriate, whereas the tax effect of their decision would have been. Significantly, it was also confirmed that even if the principle applies, the trustee's decision is not automatically void, but rather it is merely voidable at the discretion of the court. So, to summarise, if the trustees have a power or the trust is a discretionary trust, and if the trustees fail to take into account, into account a relevant consideration, or if they fail to take into account a relevant consideration, and if the trustee's original decision constitutes a breach of trust, then the trustee's decision is voidable. That the decision is voidable means that it may be set aside by the court if the court considers that to be appropriate so that the trustees can make their decision again. So the decision is not automatically void. So if the trustees fail to take into account the fact that the trust and its beneficiaries would suffer a large capital gain tax or inheritance tax charge, then that would be an example of a trustee failing to take into account a relevant consideration. And that can be seen from the case of Burrell and Burrell from 2005. The effect would be that the trustee's decision would be set aside as though it had never been exercised in that way, with the happy result that the action that invoked the tax charge would be similarly revoked. Okay, and the very final trustee duty I want to look at is the duty to provide information and an account to beneficiaries. So the trustees must keep accounts and be able to produce them to beneficiaries. So if you are the beneficiary of a trust, you have the right to see accounts and see what is happening with the money. An important part of the ability of the beneficiaries to control the trust uh, of the, the trustees, sorry, is their ability to force the trustees to account to the beneficiaries by way of giving information to them as to the administration of the trust. There is an obligation on the trustees to account in the sense of the provision of information by the trustees to the beneficiaries and a duty to render accounts giving an indication of the financial position of the trust. Now, in this case here, it was said that um, only beneficiaries with a right to the income of the trust are entitled to see all the accounts, while strictly speaking a person with a remained interest is only entitled to see accounts relating to their interest in the trust. So only those with a right to the income can see the accounts. A remainder therefore can only see the material relevant to their own interest in the trust. So the traditional English view is that access to information is limited to those with proprietary rights in the trust property to information relating specifically to the property in which they have rights. However, an alternative approach has been mooted by the Privy Council in Schmidt and Rosewood, which recognises the court's general discretion to supervise trusts and so to order access to information in favour of an applicant whenever it sees fit. Okay, that is the end of trustees' duties. I know that was quite a lot of different duties there, considering it took five videos to do that, but I'm hoping I've explained them all in a way which is fairly straightforward to understand, but as ever, if you have any questions about that, about this video or any of the trustees' duties, then please do leave a comment below and I'll get straight back to you. In the next videos, we're going to start talking about trustees powers. Thank you very much for watching.